Hello everybody, we are back with our book study for the book, The Vortex. And um, if you want to catch up, if you're interested in past, um, past sessions of the book study, they are all available on my YouTube channel. So all you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Zimahoon and there's a separate playlist where I'm where I'm sharing all of these. Plus they are also getting saved in the Abraham Fun group. So that's another way that you can you can find them if you scroll through the events. All right. I am excited to get started today. Um, I love this portion of the book because it has to do with parenting. I most certainly learned a lot about parenting from this book. And I think that this book was instrumental in my um, improving, improving my relationships with friends and family members. All right, so last time we stopped on page 33. Today we are going to start off with the heading to the child. So Abraham here is addressing the child because we already started on the subject of family last time. So if you look at the heading on page 30, it is how do we harmonize a diverse family? So we are already looking at relationships in families. And so now the heading today is about the child. So Abraham says, your parents mean well. And when I'm coaching people, this is the one thing that I point out to everybody is that your parents and you both want your success. You want to be happy and successful. Guess what? Your parents want you to be happy and successful. There is not a single parent in the world that says, I want my children to not be successful. There's no such thing. It does not happen. But where it goes wonky or wrong is, or off track is probably a better word, where it goes off track is that parents think that the children will have the same struggles in life that they did and they want to prepare their children for the So Abraham says, your parents mean, mean well, they are mostly just trying to prepare you for the struggles of life. What they don't realize is that you don't have to struggle. The struggle part only happens if um, if you have exactly the same beliefs. So if parents never communicate their belief system to their children, then the children will not have the same belief system as the parents. And therefore, the journey of the parent and the ch child can be a completely different journey. It does not have to be the same. And so, and then Abraham says, the reason parents behave this way is because they are vulnerable. Why are they vulnerable? Because they've forgotten who they really are. They no longer remember their power. And they also believe that you as the child are also vulnerable. They believe that you as the child are vulnerable because they also don't remember who you really are. They don't know your power. They've forgotten it. They did know it, but they have forgotten it. So folks on Facebook, if you guys want to join us um, in, in, the word, in the Zoom room, you can grab the link from the events page. When you mark Heather, Tamika, Good to see you guys. So you can, if you want to, you can join us on Zoom or you can, you can stay on Facebook. Everybody is welcome. All right. So moving along. Abraham suggests to the child. 
So if you were the child, Abraham is talking to you. And we are all children, right? We all came from somewhere. Hi, Yolanda. Good to see you. And so Abraham says, disregard. Just remember that they mean well, but don't let it matter to you. It does not matter what anyone else thinks about you. It only matters what you think. So if you were to disregard what people think about everything, including what they think about you, then you would be able to hold yourself steady. You would be more sure, sure-footed, sure-footed where? On the journey of life. You would be sure-footed on the journey of life. You'd be sure-footed on the emotional scale. You'd be able to maintain your stability on the emotional scale and maintaining your stability on the emotional scale from a place that is high on the emotional scale is the secret to success. That is the secret to success. So Abraham says, as you hear this, it will help you to feel more patient about others. We are in the second last paragraph uh, from the bottom. So if you hear this and it resonates with you and you start understanding that, yes, this is true, it will help you to feel patient with other people because they don't remember. You'll just be able to say, well, you know, they don't remember. It's okay. And it's okay that they don't remember. I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to internalize it. Um, and then Abraham says something really, really important. It took me right back to my childhood when I read this. Abraham said, when you are alone as the child, what are you doing in your thoughts? Are you inviting more incidents of being in trouble? I used to. I used to get into a lot of trouble. I was called the troublemaker. I was always getting in trouble. And... The reason I went back in time when I read this is because when I was alone, I used to think about why I was getting in trouble. Like I used to think that my parents were trying to control me. And the more I thought about it, the more I, um, I kept myself in that vibration. Well, guess what? The more you keep yourself in that vibration, then the more of it you bring to yourself. So the less you think your parents are trying to control you, the less they try to control you. The more you think that they are trying to control you. Thoughts like, oh my God, my mother just doesn't understand that I really have to finish this chapter of this book because it's so much fun. I, I, I'm, I'm dying to find out what's going to happen next in this Enid Blyton mystery that I'm reading now. I have to find out what's going to happen next. My mother just doesn't understand. And, and she wants me to go and do something else. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to help you in the kitchen. I don't want to. I don't want to do my multiplication tables. Leave me alone. I want to finish this book. Well, the more you think that way, then the more you feel that you're being controlled. Abraham says, you are in charge of the way your parents treat you. And <laughs> please, show of hands here, how many of us thought that we were in charge of the way our parents treated us? Did you feel that you were in charge of the way you, your parents treated you? No, no. I, I, I think that unless you're born in a generation of parents who know Abraham's work, you're going to say no to this, right? And, and that is so important to understand because I, need, I didn't know it. My son sure knows it. My daughter sure knows it. They know it. They know that I don't control. But they know that because I, I, I parented based on Abraham's teachings. So my children know it, but I sure didn't know it. I did not know that I'm in charge of the way my parents treat me. I sure didn't know it. 
I hi, hi Andrew. That. Oops. I'm in charge of the way my parents treat me. Here we go. That should fix it. <laughs> okay. Hi. So, the best part is that you will be showing them, even if they do not realize it, how to enjoy harmony by inspiring it rather than demanding it. We're on page 34, the second, uh, the second paragraph there. So, you see, you can inspire harmony. I sure did not know it as a child. I absolutely, there were times when I thought my parents hate me. I actually remember packing a bag and getting my bicycle ready to run away from home. I actually remember that. That's how, that's how controlled and unloved I felt that I wanted to run away. And I think I was maybe about seven or eight. And the, the funny thing is, I didn't even know how to read the uh, uh, ride the bike. I, I had a bike, but I didn't know how to ride it. But I was ready to run away with it. <laughs> Makes me laugh when I think about it now. Um, but why? Why did I think that way? Because even though my parents loved me, I did not feel loved. There's a big difference. Um, and then Abraham, the next part is addressed to the parent. And to the parents, Abraham says, that's the heading. The behavior that you elicit from your child is more about you than it is about your child. Our children don't make us angry. We're angry and we take it out on them. Right? It's like uh, um, we are already frustrated and then we see something and it triggers us. It becomes a trigger. But the behavior that you elicit from your child is more about you than it is about your child. And the more you try and control the behavior of your child, the more the child will act out. I know that from being a child myself and remembering, and I know that from my children. If we give the children, my mother, if we were going to visit someone in the car, my mother would read us a lecture about how we were going to behave. You know, like she would, it was just like, you, you do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Somebody offers you cookies, only take one. Make sure you say please and thank you. And it was just, a, and don't, you are not allowed. When they tell you to sit, that's where you're going to sit and you're going to stay sitting. And if you, if you misbehave, then you know, I will get even with you when we get home. So that was... Fear. It was like it, it, we were afraid of not acting a certain way. And the more you elicit a behavior, more demands you make on your child, then it's really, you make it difficult for the child. Because every rule that you make is like a uh, uh, a, a boss that the child is answering to, right? So they have so many moving parts, it, it becomes hard. And what the parent does not realize is that when they're doing that, when my mother was telling me not to misbehave, my brother and I in the car, when she was reading us that lecture, she was visualizing negative behavior. She was visualizing all the things that could go wrong because we were not behaving the way she wanted us to. So that negative visualization had nothing to do with us. It had completely to do with her. So that's what Abraham means when they say, the behavior that you elicit from your child is more about you than it is about your child. If you're doing a negative visualization, powerful creator that you are, then that's what you're going to get. If you could de-emphasize the unwanted behavior you see in your child by ignoring it, 
not replaying it over and over again in your mind, not speaking to others about it, not worrying about it, you would not be continue be a you would not be a continuing contributor to the unwanted behavior. Now that reminds me of the story that Abraham told, and I forget is it in this book or was it in Ask and It Is Given about the father. I think it was in Ask and It Is Given. Yes. Uh, so this father came to Abraham and. It's, it's a video track as well. Uh, I'm sure you can find it somewhere on YouTube. Is that uh, this child, this father came to Abraham and said that every morning when the father went into the son's room and the son was about six or seven, that the son was wetting his bed. And uh, Abraham said to the father, well, what do you feel when you go into your child's room in the morning? And the father said, well, I expect, I expect that he's going to have wet his bed. But that's the thing. Because he expected it, that's what he got. Your expectation is your knowing. Your expectation is what you're bringing out of the vortex. If you so, and, and in the Heart and Mind Alignment Program, I teach people an exercise to gauge, to make a list of things. And you can do this exercise. It's really easy to do. Make a list of things that you have been waiting to see happen, waiting to manifest for more than a year or two. If there are things that you have been waiting to manifest for a year or two, now give them an expectancy rating, which means on a scale of 1 to 10, do I expect that these things that I've been waiting for for the last two years or more, that they will happen in the next 12 months? Because if, if you don't absolutely believe, so if your expectancy rating is 2 out of 3, five out of, uh, sorry, five out of 10, two out of 10. That means that you don't really expect that thing to happen in the next 10 months, one year. You don't expect it to happen. And if you don't expect it to happen, trust me, it's not going to happen. So what are the things that you really, really want? And it usually, you have a low expectancy rating for things that you really, 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 really want. When you really, really, really want something and it's not appearing right before your eyes, it's because you don't expect it. Because you don't expect it, it cannot happen. Because if you don't expect it, that means that you have belief systems that are opposing it. If you have belief systems that are opposing it, it's not going to happen. So all those things that have been waiting to happen for more than two years, you, whether you think you are positive thinking or you think you're not positive thinking, you have beliefs that are not letting that happen. Because there's no other way. Law of attraction is exact. Law of attraction is so exact that it's not the law that is broken and that's why you're not getting what you want. It can never be that. It is only for one reason and that is you've got thoughts that you don't even know are there that are blocking it. So there's a whole process in the Heart and Mind Alignment Program that I teach people for, for, for unraveling this and bringing themselves to a place where they can shift that expectancy rating. And all the material that I teach is based on Abraham's teachings. I did not create it. I just took it from Abraham and organized it in, in, a, in a more organized fashion. That's it. It's all out there. All right. So you have to expect it. If you expect bad behavior from your child, then you get bad behavior from your child. 
if you change your expectancy, you'll get good behavior from your child. Right? So children will act out when they feel a negative vibration coming from the parent. And here's the thing that I'm going to add to that is that your vibration, your negative vibration does not necessarily have to be about the child. It could be that you had a bad day at work. But the child, when they feel that negative vibration, they respond, they have a choice about how they will respond to that vibration. Because every one of us makes a decision, even a child, even a baby makes a decision about how they're going to respond. So the child can respond by thinking, oh, my father or my mother has, is feeling, the, is sending this negative vibration my way, this uncomfortable, I'm getting an uncomfortable feeling. Oh, it must be about me. I must have done something must be they're not happy with me or the child can say oh you're feeling negative vibration see ya I'm gonna go play with something that decision comes from the child and children have already learned how they're going to respond by the age of three they've already figured out how they're going to respond to their parents negative and positive vibration. So, um, so your child is a powerful creator who wants to feel good and be of value. If you do not take score in the moment and decree him, otherwise he will rise to the goodness of his natural being. When you're in a state of fear, worry, anger or frustration, you will evoke unwanted behavior from your child. Because most children are sponges. Most children are not ducks. Um, and that's, that's, if you're not familiar with it, that's lingo that I use to differentiate. Um, a sponge, in my mind, a sponge is a person who absorbs everything. So if, if, if you were a, th a sponge and I throw you on the top of a, uh, into a pond, you're going to float for two seconds and then you're going to absorb everything and sink right to the bottom. But if you were a duck and I throw you into a pond, you're just going to shake your feathers and fly off, right? So a duck is a person in, in my la language that I've created for myself. A duck is a, a person who does not allow anything to get to them. And sponges are people who absorb everything everyone is thinking and saying, and they just sink. And then if they keep sinking, they need someone else to pull them out, wring them free of everything. And so, uh, and I used to use that analogy because it made sense to me because I was prone to depression. And, and I was a sponge and I needed other people to help me come back out. I couldn't do it on my own. And a sponge, once a sponge sinks, cannot wring itself out and bring itself out of the pond. So that's in my head. I, I said, okay, you're a sponge. You need to become a duck. You need to have the opposite response. Somebody throws something at you verbally, emotionally, it should not affect you. So that became the the goal that I had in my journey was to become a duck. Very important words on page 35 at the top of the page. Abraham says, your child was not born to please you. But unfortunately for most of humanity, that's not how we think. We want to have babies because we want to enjoy having babies. Right? We make it about us and it's not about us. The, ch the child was not born to please you. You were not born to please your parents. But oftentimes that's not the case. It's co-creation even when it is your own child. When you have a baby, it is a co-creation of um, one point of attraction 
of source with another point of attraction of source. Both come from source, return to source, and are here to co-create. Don't own each other and are not there to please each other. To you who are asking the question, and this is Jerry. Yes, go ahead. Yes, absolutely, go ahead. What, what is one way that we can, if our expectancy rate is low when we write the list and how, what, what can we do to bring that up? Mm. You have to join the heart and mind alignment program and then I'll teach you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's all, uh, it's all about your self-talk. Drawing these diagrams makes law of attraction so much more clear. And that's why the book Thrive has so many diagrams in it. Um, okay, so let's draw this scale here. This is the emotional scale. What I want you to understand is that we don't just have one emotional scale. Well, we do because emotions converge. But every time you focus, so let's say this is me focusing on my puppy, Stella. When I focus on my puppy, Stella, I go up here. I go up here. This is where my emotions about Stella are. They're pretty high on the emotional scale. In fact, most of the time they're right at the top here. But then I stop looking at Stella and I'm looking at something else. And maybe this is some work that I'm doing. I'm just going to say this is work that I'm doing. And with respect to the work I'm doing, maybe I'm not here. So I like to use a scale of 10. So 10 to me is the top of the emotional scale. And down here is zero. That's depression, one or zero. So with respect to my work, maybe I'm not exactly a 10 today. Maybe I am a seven today with respect to my work. I'm over here. So the, the thing is, how much time am I spending at a seven? How much time am I spending at a 10? How much time? So when I switch now, I'm, let's say my favorite topic, I am eating food. This is my food. And on the subject of food, I'm always a 10, right? But then there's another subject in my life. And maybe this is my ex, although it does not uh, apply anymore because my ex and I are very good friends now. But, uh, but let's say that I think about my ex and it drops me right down here to a three on that subject. But what's happening is I'm spending most of my time today thinking about him or something he's annoyed me about. So all of these vibrations are converging, right? So uh, how much of my day did I spend on this, uh, on a 10? I was a 10 here. I was a 10 here. Uh, but I was only a 10 for 20% of my day. Right? And then I was at a 7 of my work. I spent a lot of time on my work. I, I only went for a couple of walks with Stella and, you know, I ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Didn't take all my time, but this work stuff, it took a lot of my time. And I'm fortunate enough to absolutely love the work that I do. So out of my total waking time, maybe I spend 50% of my time at a seven. So I spent at a three the rest of my time. And that's a good 30% of my time. So even though I was high on the scale for some part of the day, my overall emotional scale, my, my cumulative joint emotional scale is not going to be a 10. 
it's it's because this 30 the weightage on this 30 is going to drop me down so this is what we don't understand that's why abraham says it's your balance of thought so a lot of times people uh, spend some time over here and then they assume that they're here but as we go from one subject to another subject to another subject we are literally going to a different emotional scale we have different emotional scales for every subject in our life so it's about the balance of this is why abraham uses the term to say what was your balance of thought what was your balance of thought and so when we go off on autopilot we are not aware where we are going and a lot of times if you're worrying about something you're dropping below the five mark on the emotional scale if you're worrying about something you're spending your time on the negative side of the emotional scale and you don't even know it so how do we know it our manifestations tell us what's going on and this is what i realized i when i realized that every subject is a different emotional scale it became more easy for me to understand the teachings of abraham and it made me more aware that i need to i need to be mindful of where i am and how much time i'm spending there and this is why you cannot so i'm just going to stop sharing my screen just now um you cannot just meditate for 10 minutes and or half an hour what are you doing for the rest of the day right so because every subject takes us somewhere on the emotional scale every subject does and if you're someone who spends a lot of time on autopilot, if your manifestations are not working the way you want them to, and you think that you're a positive person, a lot of people come to me for coaching like that. They say, Zara, um, I'm a I'm, um, very positive person. And, and my answer then is, then you don't need me because you're a very positive person. You should be getting everything that you want in life. So are there things in your life that are not happening the way you want them to? And if the answer is yes, then you go through that expectancy rating exercise and you just make a decision that you're going to be more positive. So I was going to show you why it becomes complicated. I'm going to go back to that diagram. For some things, it's very easy for us to change our expectancy. It's very easy. We can just go to a 10 right away. We don't have to find our negative beliefs and work on them because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that much. It's the example that Abraham uses of someone who uh, comes, uh, uh, who calls you and says, I will never call you again. Someone calls you and says, I will never call you again. Well, guess what? I don't really care. You don't call me. It doesn't upset my apple cart. I am still able to stay on at a level of 10 on the emotional scale, even though you're never going to call me. So it has not had any effect on my, emo on my emotional scale. But if I pick a different color, I'm going to pick green. Green is the color of money and money is the subject I want to talk about. But I have bills to pay every month. They come around every month, and when they come around, they drop me down to a three. So the thing is, how much time am I thinking about the bills that I have to pay? A lot of time, and it's recurring. You see, this blue thing, this blue person who said, I'm never going to call you again, then I don't care about them. So I'm able to stay a 10 on the emotional scale because I don't care and they're never coming back again. So I never have to feel bad about it. But money on the subject of money, I go there all the time. So I cannot start where I am and go forward. It is way harder for those things that are recurring. We cannot start 
from where we are and go forward and be positive because that negativity catches on every month. So on the subject of money, I have to, here's what I did. And it was truly life-changing when I realized all of this, I did something that helped me a lot. And what I did was, I did what Abraham told me to do. Basically, guys, I've just been a very good student. I, I take what Abraham says and I do it. I never question it. And then I go back and I figure out what was going on vibrationally. So Abraham said, I didn't have money to pay bills. And I heard Abraham say, well, you don't have to spend the whole month thinking about the fact that you won't have money to pay the bills on the first of the month. How about you don't think about it every day? And I said, wow, really? And Abraham said, if you stop thinking about it, magical things will start happening in your life and your money situation will change. So I said, okay, Abraham, that's okay. I, I hear you. Every time the thought of money comes into my head, I'm going to say, Abraham said, don't think about it. And I'm going to go find something else to think about. And by doing that, what I did was I would go down, I would go down, but then I would bring myself back up because I would remind myself that Abraham will keep their promise. So I would come back up. And then while I was up here, I would do a rampage of appreciation. Actually, maybe I came up here. And then from here, I would do a rampage of appreciation on, on a subject. And at the end of that rampage of appreciation, again, I did what Abraham once said, that was move it to a better place and leave it there. So what I started doing was I would do a rampage and that would take me right up here. I would start the rampage at this place. Maybe I should use a different pen here. Um, I'll go use this one. So I would start my rampage here, but by the time I was done my rampage, I was up here. And so here I would introduce one sentence about money. And by the way, universe, could you please help me manifest more money? And I would write that sentence, put a great big full stop at the end of that sentence and leave it at a better place. And then what I would do is as my beliefs about money would come up, I would work on them. So, so when I, as I was doing this work, there were times when I would think about this and the thought would come, how are you going to come up with more money? And I would say, well, Abraham says all things are possible. So this is a negative belief. I am going to work this negative belief out of my system. And so then I would start with the words, all things are possible. And I would write why all things are possible. Why does Abraham say all things are possible? One reason, two reasons, three reasons, four, as many reasons as I could come up with. So because I was coming up with reasons to negate this negative belief, with time, the negative belief went away. So it was a combination of do, working on the subject and getting off the subject and introducing the subject at a higher vibration. Three things, a combination of three things. It was not one thing. And that is why if you just think that you're going to achieve results by just doing one thing, it does not work. It's a combination of things and you have to know which one to do when. You have to pay enough attention to what Abraham teaches us to, to know when to introduce the topic, when to work on it, when to leave it alone. You need to understand why Abraham is asking us to do these things. And you have to you have, to have um, a combined approach using all of these things. And... The, the reason I coach people through it when I have people taking the heart and mind alignment program is because then I can help them figure out how to do it. Because when it's right here under your nose, you don't know the difference. 
a lot of times. And I'm not saying that it's like that for everyone because some people can figure it out and just run with it. Go with it. I figured it out. Because I figured it out, I believe everyone has the capacity to figure it out. But there are some people who want to do it faster. Or there are some people who are telling themselves that they can't. I don't see what's wrong and I don't know how to fix it. Well, then that's when having someone else take a look at it helps. Right? So that's the very long answer to your question, Lakshmi, that it is not one thing. It's not one thing. It's very easy to say, oh, yeah, do this and then everything's going to fall into place. No, it's not like that. That's why Abraham in the book, Ask and It Is Given, Abraham has given us 22 different processes. And they have told us when to apply these processes because the same thing does not work under different situations. It's a combination. And furthermore, experiment. I made lots of mistakes. That's why I wrote the book, Manifesting Mistakes. Right? I made lots of mistakes. But I was not afraid to experiment. That is the thing that I have to give myself credit for. I was not afraid to experiment. And I was not afraid to experiment because I truly believe that Abraham is going to help me figure it out. Right? Sure, Elena, go ahead. You're muted, sweetheart. You wrote many books. Which one to start with first? Can you tell me the sequence, please? Each book is written... Each book is written as a gift from source. Any one of them, you can pick up any one of them and they stand on their own. Each one of them is a complete piece of work, not connected with any other piece. However, there are four books that if you read them, and it doesn't matter in which order you read them, but there are four books that if you read them, I believe that your understanding of Law of Attraction will will be deepened massively. Um, I can tell you the order in which I received the books. Because I always say I don't write the books, I receive them. I can tell you the order in which I received the books. The order in which I received the books is Unlimited, Thrive, How to Pray So That God Listens, and Manifesting Mistakes. Mm -hmm. Repeat it please, Unlimited, Thrive, How to... How, How to Pray So That God Listens, and... Manifesting mistakes. That is the order in which I received the books. Now, having said that, I'll tell you what each book does. So, um, I have most of them here. So, Thrive. Thrive is, is all the diagrams. There are 42 diagrams in this book. And it is a stepwise construction of how... Law of Attraction works using the principle physics, using physics as the basis. Okay, so because I'm a scientist, I don't know what I am actually, but part of my journey is being a scientist. I'm a trained microbiologist. So, So I have science in my background and I'm analytical. So this book for me was the bridge between taking physics and applying it to law of attraction because I could see the parallels. And that's why I'm doing the quantum physics presentation on the 26th, the spirituality and science and spirituality. Science in spirituality is what I'm calling it. (laughs) Um, So Thrive gives you It gives you the building blocks of how law of attraction is constructed. What is the law of attraction? Unlimited gives you the tools. And if you follow the workbook, it gives you the habit. And being consistent, having the habit is really, really important. 
because and then moving on next to how to pray so that God listens is in the, the role of that book is to bridge religion with spiritual with law of attraction because most of us including myself were born into some sort of a religion and we pushed back some of us did i did some of us pushed back and so what happened when i actually uh, started understanding law of attraction is that i found that what people were trying to teach me when i was younger in the form of religion actually is part of law of attraction the only problem was they were teaching it in a way that i could not understand it because they were teaching the ritual the outward action they were not teaching the feeling part of it they were not explaining to me why uh, how my feelings and my emotions were connected they became they wanted to replace my guidance system with them but when i understood law of attraction i was able to bridge that so that whole book how to pray so that god listens is about the practice of appreciation which is gratitude is part of every religion make peace with where you are this too shall pass all those things that i was taught when i was a kid now they make sense so that book actually helps us to because for a lot of us um religion cre- has created confusion and part of moving forward is being able to deal with that confusion so that's the role that that book plays and if that wasn't important to you you don't need to read that book and then the book manifesting mistakes this one is the one that i wrote after i broke the bank and messed up everything <laughs> because i look back and i figured out what did i where did i go wrong so that i don't go wrong again right i wanted to make sure i understand completely so then this it, it it completes the circle in the sense that don't make these mistakes as you're using law of attraction don't make these ris- mistakes and then you will get consistently good results it's not enough knowing the theory you see so you see when i wrote thrive that was the theory right then unlimited was the practical go into the lab do your practical and then once you do the practical you've got to have a conclusion when you ha- how many over here have actually done experiments in a lab i don't know anyway you have okay fantastic so you understand that when you do a, a practical after that you have to write the results these were this is this is what i got as a result of the exercise that i did and then you build on that right so what i realized was unlimited is the practical without the conclusion it's teaching you all the tools you're taking them and you're applying them to your life but then are you documenting the results that you're getting are you you know what is going on and if you document the results then you will come up with the fact that sometimes you were successful and sometimes you were not so you have to use that to say why was i successful and why was i not successful so that the next time i use the same tools i want better success so that's why this group of books completes the in my mind it completes the understanding of how law of attraction works and then other books that i have written and am writing are either about tools or they are about specific areas like parenting like wealth and specific books for a specific for example my background a lot of my background you know is scientific and so um health or healing you, you know rejuvenating our bodies is a concept that i can speak to based on my scientific knowledge um 
because I have been in the financial industry for many, many years, um, I can speak to that. I can speak to sales. So I can speak to specific areas, and that's what I'm doing now, is I'm either writing books that have tools in them, helping people to apply law of attraction, or addressing specific areas of application. But I don't need to write another book on what is law of attraction. Thrive is has every all of it. Right? So, um, yeah. I'm going to write another book. Shall I tell you what it's called? I have so much fun thinking of the title. What is that? It's called Stop, Don't Think. Stop what? Don't think. Don't think? Yeah. <laughs> cool. I like it. <laughs> our thinking is our biggest problem. One of our biggest problems is thinking. All right. All right, folks, we are getting close to our time commitment, but we can get a little more of work in here. Thank you for those questions. Let's keep moving because I do want to finish this portion of it. Um, so if you stop paying attention to the negative behavior of a child, then that behavior goes away. And parents intuitively, I don't know, I my, my mother did not do this when I was a child, but when I had children, my mother used to say if they're misbehaving, don't pay attention. So, like, I don't understand. You know, when she was a grandmother, she knew it, but when she was a parent, she didn't know it. I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know why that is. But that's true. That's why they say if a child... So, there, you know, like my, when my daughter would fall and hurt herself, my mother would say, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Don't go running. Don't go running. Let and And so many parents do it when they teach their child to sleep in a crib in a different room. Right? You're teaching the child that the child should depend on itself rather than depend on the parent. Just ignore the negative behavior and then the negative behavior will go away. Right? So that's really important. And it applies to all our relationships with our spouses and our significant others, with uh, co-workers, with bosses, with anyone, any relationship. If you pay attention to the negative behavior of someone, you make that bigger. So if you don't, if you take your attention away from it by giving yourself a reason, so I say, um, give them benefit of the doubt. Just because someone is acting a certain way this time does not mean that they're going to act that way every time. When you give people benefit of the doubt, you are leaving the door of possibility open. You're saying anything is possible. It's not necessary that this will happen again. And that is how you can shift whatever behavior people are showing you. Because the behavior that you get from someone is a reflection of what you think about them and what you think about yourself. It's a combination of what you think about them and what you think about yourself. So anyway, moving forward from there to you who are asking the question, which is Jerry. Do not worry about a child losing freedom to unknowing parents and do not worry about unknowing parents losing freedom to their children. Understand that all of them have their own guidance. Everybody has their own guidance system. And that is why we never have to worry about them. I remember when my son was very little, I had this fear that I was able to resolve using Abraham's teachings is that I need to hold his hand all the time. What if he steps into the road? And I remember my daughter who is older, I used to hold her hand so tightly that it would hurt her. That's how tight I used to hold her hand. Because I was so scared that she's going to get away or, you know, she's going to get into an accident or I'm going to lose her in a crowd and, and whatever. 
And then I did lose her in a crowd. That's a whole other story. But by the time my son came along, I was on to Abraham's teachings. And I did lose him, but I found him. He was right there. Right? So I learned to apply the, the, the teachings. And then I learned to tell myself, no, I don't have to hold his hand because he has his own guidance, which is going to tell him not to step in front of a car. He has his own guidance. I don't have to protect him. So it was very difficult, but I trusted that what Abraham is telling me is true. And I did it. I did not hold his hand. And I, 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 I think I've shared before, maybe in the Ask and It Is Given book study, but um, I have shared before that if he wanted tools, I gave him, he was not satisfied with a plastic hammer. He wanted a real hammer, so he got one. Right? And I had to, before I gave him that hammer, now he was two years old. This is a two-year child, has a real hammer and real screwdrivers and real tools. I had to do the work to not be afraid. And I, I, I was at that, even at that point, I was at that place where I was not afraid that he was going to hurt himself with the tools. I was more afraid that he's going to hurt my walls with the tools. <laughs> so by that time, I had already dealt with the fear of him hurting himself. I dealt with that fear when he was very tiny, when he was just sitting and reaching for things. I had already dealt with that fear. I don't know if I've told you guys the story, but, you know, we had a fireplace and I was initially afraid that he's going to go burn his hand. And then I said, no, he has guidance. And so what if he burns his hand the one time, you know, his body can heal itself. I'm, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to be, I'm not, I'm, I was making my life miserable because I wanted to watch him all the time to make sure he didn't go near the fireplace. And I, one day I just said to myself, this is crazy. This is nuts. I can't do this. I can't be there all the time. So I have to trust Abraham. When Abraham says the child has its own guidance system, I'm going to trust Abraham. So I said, okay. What's he going to do? The worst he's going to do is go and touch the, uh, you know, the fireplace and burn his hand. It's okay. I can deal with it. And, and so what happened? He touched it with one finger, took the finger away really quickly, never did it again. Right? But if I had kept on protecting him, then I would not have let him use his own guidance system. So this child, when he was eight years old, I, I lived on a ravine lot and we had a stream running in the back. He would just wander off into the forest on his own. And I would let him because I would, I, 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 from the time that he was that little, by the time he was eight, I had completely trained myself not to worry about him at all. But I can tell you, it takes a lot of work to get to that place where we are not taught like that. I was not taught like that. My, my mother would be at the door if we were half an hour late coming back because there were no cell, cell phones, right? She would be at the door worrying. That's how I grew up. I grew up with the idea that People who love each other worry about each other. And then I had to retrain myself to say my worry only hurts the people that I love. So I'm not going to do it anymore. So I can tell you that actually following this advice that is in these pages is a lot of work. But if you do the work, oh, the rewards are just, I have so much freedom. I don't worry about my children. I don't worry. Um, my my son and his girlfriend, my son's 18. They're both 18. They went to Toronto for uh, Valentine's Day. And 
I decided they are going to have fun. I don't have to check in with him. So I didn't. And then uh, I usually go to bed around just past midnight. So it was midnight and my son was not home. And I said to myself, well, I guess they're having a lot of fun. They've decided to stay in Toronto. All right. I went off to bed. I didn't call him. I didn't make his life miserable. When are you coming home? What are you doing? Why are you out so late? I didn't worry about where he's going to stay in Toronto. Like, okay, he's decided he's not coming. He's having too much fun. All right. I guess I'll see him tomorrow. That's so freeing. It is so freeing. I slept and slept well. Now the next day, I think it was six o'clock and, uh, and he was not home. And I thought, okay, I guess he's having way too much fun. And then I was like, okay, but now it's dinner time. So should I cook for two or three, him and his girlfriend? Should I cook for them or should I just have leftovers? So then I called him. I said, I'm going to make dinner. Should I make dinner for you or not? And he said, don't worry about it. I said, okay, bye. So I didn't cook for him because I told myself, he said, don't worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to feed myself and go to bed. And if he does come, I'll fix him something quickly. It's not such a big deal. They're having fun. It's good. They're young. I love it when they have fun, right? So I was already in bed when he came home the next day on the 15th. I was in bed. I heard the door open and I hollered down, Ferris, do you want anything to eat? That was my first question. And my second question was, is Emma staying over or is she, has she gone home? That was my second question. Because if she's here, then I want to make sure in the morning I remember to make breakfast for them. That's all. So I asked him, did you take pictures? Did you have fun? Did you take pictures? He said, yes. I said, okay, I'll see them tomorrow. Good night. But can you, can you imagine the freedom that that gives me? That I don't have to worry? And it's the same thing with my daughter. And my children are so grateful because they tell me, Oh my God, mom, I was out with so-and-so friend and his mother called him every half an hour. And this other friend, his parents have uh, the thing where they can track his phone. So one of his friends came to visit him one day and he came to our house and Ferris and this boy, they were sitting in the car outside. They didn't come into the house. They were sitting outside in the car. And his mother called him. And she said, why are you at Ferris's house? And my son came in saying, oh my God, I'm so grateful. You don't do that to me. So, so you see, but see how much it is freeing for him. And how much freeing it is for me and how much I can trust my children. I know that when they need me, they'll call me and each one of them has a separate bell, you know, like a, a ringtone. So I know which one of them is calling me. And they know that it doesn't matter what I'm doing. If they call me, I will pick it up. And it has happened sometimes that I'm in the middle of a coaching appointment with a client and one of them calls me and I tell my client, this is my child. I'm going to take this call because I know my children know that I am working and that they only call me if they really need me. Otherwise, they don't bother me. I don't bother them. And you know what? We love each other so much more because of it. My, my children tell me, they, they completely are able to trust me because they know that I trust them. I'm not keeping tabs on them. I'm not going into their... My son one day told me, I don't like it when you come into my room and move my things around. 
don't come into my room. And I said, you know, he's right. If somebody came into my room and moved my things around, I would kill them. So I stopped going into his room. But there's so much trust, right? He knows I'm not going to go into his room because he's told me don't go into his room. But what happened is now I don't need to go into his room because he does such a good job of cleaning his room. Because the only reason I used to go into his room was to put his laundry away or, you know, put his things away or bring dirty dishes down. But I don't have to do that anymore. More freedom to me. He does it himself. And he does a way better job than I was doing. So, so you have to trust people. I get, I usually, if somebody wants to join one of my groups and they don't have a profile picture, I don't accept them unless they've already had a conversation with me. The reason is somebody who does not trust the world enough they are people who don't trust the world. They are so scared. And that's not, that's not the vibration I want in any one of my groups. You see? I don't want people who don't trust. I don't want to be, I don't want their vibration mixed up with mine. And there are often times, they, uh, during one of my courses, I ask people who didn't have their own personal pictures to put their personal pictures on their profiles because what are you afraid of i mean if you're afraid of putting your picture on your profile what are you afraid of like you you think that that you're not guided that you don't have source looking after you that you have to be afraid of something well if you're afraid of something you're actually calling it to you if you are saying, I don't want people to know who I am because they'll take advantage of me, then that's the, what you're putting out there. What are you going to get in return? Right? To me, that's like, wow. Wow, people spend their whole life living in so much fear. Don't do that. And don't do it to your children either. If you trust your children and your grandchildren, if you have any... Um, you'll get trust back. When you trust others, you get trust back. It literally is, that's what law of attraction is. So Abraham is saying, the child gives birth to desires about greater freedom, being appreciated, appreciating others more, independence, opportunities to expand, opportunities to, de opportunities to excel. And it's wonderful. And, and I'll tell you something, you never have to, they have their own guidance, they'll figure it out. Until grade 11, my son had no idea what he was going to do. His favorite occupation was doing nothing. I don't want to work. And uh, other people who spoke to him, for example, my, my brother, would get concerned about his lack of ambition. And I would just tell them he'll figure it out. I don't care. He'll figure it out. And if he ends up not doing anything, I don't care for that either. Like, I'm, I'm not concerned. He'll be fed. He'll, he'll, have a, he'll, he'll figure it out. And fast forward two years later, he is so focused on what he wants to do. And I didn't play any role in helping him figure it out. The only role I played was when he wanted to come and talk, I let him talk. I listened without giving him any opinion. I was just, you know, like a dummy. <laughs> he was talking to a dummy. I was just there listening. His father actually made my life miserable, saying, you're not guiding him. You're not telling him. And I would say to him, I don't need to guide him or tell him. He'll figure it out. Now, in a relationship that's broken up, that's, a difficult thing to say to so he would say to me you don't worry about him and I would say yes I don't worry about him I trust him you should as well that's a really difficult place to be to you know to to have this other parent telling you that you're not worried enough 
Yes, but I've learned that that's the wrong thing to do. So, but it's interesting when you have to explain that to someone. It's very interesting. Through offering parental control, the parent gives birth to desires about having more freedom, experiencing more cooperation, the child having a good life, the child being ready for the world he will step onto, out into one day and being understood. And what I want you to know about this is that the reason Abraham is saying that is because what is wrong with giving birth to more desire? So for those parents who are controlling, they're not really damaging their child in any way. They're actually, they're, they are putting into the vortex their desire for the child's well-being. And whatever you put into the vortex, you can manifest. So there's really nothing going wrong either way. But I can tell you that it's a happier journey when you're not trying to control. That's all. It's a happy, either way, nothing is going wrong. But I can tell you from having done it two different ways. So my daughter, I, 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 my daughter's upbringing was based on what I learned from my parents. My son's upbringing was based on Abraham's uh, teachings. And then I had to reprogram my daughter in her teenagers, which was in fact a very interesting experience as well. But I can tell you that nothing ever goes wrong because it doesn't matter. Step one is a starting point for your journey. So nothing can go wrong and you never get it done. So it doesn't matter if you were doing it a different way before, because you can always change it. And even if you never change it, nothing can go wrong because my parents were very controlling, but I turned out okay, I think. <laughs> right? In fact, I turned out better than anything they could have expected. I don't think my parents, when, when I was a kid, would have expected that I would have written so many books and owned so many properties and done all the things that I've done in my life. They would never have anticipated any of it. Yet they were controlling. I just didn't get controlled. <laughs> right? But it's about what you say in your head that's important. It's, it, it doesn't matter. They controlled me and I gave in. I did not fight them. My actions were based on what they wanted. But my thoughts were not. My thoughts were not. They never controlled my thoughts. They only controlled my action. Right? In the end, it all worked out. All right, folks. Thank you for staying with me. We've gone over our time commitment, but uh, it's always so much fun doing this. I get carried away with it. I hope you found value in it, and I will catch you next week. Bye for now. Thank you, Sarah. Bye.